change. Um, we have done the, uh, the... Well, Goose is now nine weeks old. Goose is the uh, English Springer Spaniel that we, we now have. So this is the second one. He is nine weeks old, a bundle of joy, and has razor-sharp teeth. Uh, <laughs> So we've been uh, we've been uh, taking shifts, me and my wife, to uh, stay up with him whenever he's you know cries. Uh, dogs at that age have a very small bladder, and therefore, whenever they wake up, they need to go to the loo. Um, and we've been doing this quite frequently, um, about three or four times a night. So uh, and and they'll grow out of it, grow out of it because once they they grow older, their bladders get bigger, and therefore they can hold more things and then eventually they'll be able to sleep through the night it's one of those things that, that just has to develop and, and uh, as they grow so i'm hoping that in the next few weeks i'm going to be able to have some decent sleep for once um and because of that i haven't really been doing a lot of running or exercise because i've been trying to keep myself um <laughs> been trying to keep myself awake so my Caffeine intake has increased and my exercise in, um, amount has decreased, unfortunately. But anyway, that's just the way it is. Enough complaining. I'm also working in the land of legacy at the moment. Um, so I've been doing a lot of stuff and will be doing a lot of stuff on things like, you know, PHP 5.6. So just to let people know that 5.6 is still around. <laughs> 5.6 is still around. Um, but it... it that won't have any impact on the street on what we do on, on on live streams and stuff however i might probably be doing less of the new advanced stuff in php8 um just because that's not the current wheelhouse that i'm in at the moment just to let you know so if i if i do a lot of streams where i'm talking about legacy stuff that's because legacy stuff is where i'm at <laughs> and where i will be for a while hopefully so uh, there we go. In the evenings, however, I have been working on um, some DevOps stuff for how to code well, and uh, some. Uh, this all came out, out out of the back of the last Twitch stream I did um, last Sunday, and I basically I found that I wanted to come up with a way of um, having a. a, a Having a system where I could create cron jobs um, that run against the Docker containers, and I was trying all sorts of things. I was even trying to get crons working in a Docker container, which in hindsight is completely the wrong uh, way to do it for my use case, uh, at least. So, <laughs> um, because you've got to think like a Docker container should be like a single process, and you know it's it's probably best to run a container per cron job and the, per cron script and then remove the container straight away sort of once that cron script is done store the log somewhere delete the container um basically set forget rinse and repeat um and i was going through all sorts of different ways of trying to get a, a, a container that was kind of up for a very long time that was dealing with multiple crons it's t it's basically now moved into the fact that I actually need to create a, a lab, uh, a host machine, um, where I can uh, have Docker containers on that host machine and have the cron working on the host machine that will spin up the various Docker containers whenever I need them. Uh, <laughs> so basically, it's going all the way back to what I when I was using Docker machine. Um, but in fact, what I'm doing now because of the fact that I, I'm running on Mac M1s and stuff, um, instead of using Docker Machine, which is obviously um, doesn't exist anymore, I've been using Vagrant. So I'm actually creating a Parallels uh, virtual machine, say a Ubuntu virtual machine, through Vagrant, which then has Docker on installed inside. And I'm playing, there's, I, I've got to a point where it's installed and it's, I'm having all sorts of problems with, with um, uh, file system permissions and all of that jazz. So, blech. but I have that running. I've also got Ansible running against it as well. So it's a vagrant Docker parallels Ansible sort of thing, hodgepodge at the moment. But um, I might be playing around with this on stream. So that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, maybe, uh, maybe in a few weeks time. 
because obviously the How to Code Well website needs to have cron jobs running against it. And I want to create an environment in which those cron jobs um, can work on, can, can, can be used in, in a sort of a semi-test sort of pre-prod sort of environment that I can spin up. So there we go. Um, I We have also uh, been doing the reviewing of uh, the, the, the PHP course that we're doing. And we've got two, to, well, on Tuesday on YouTube, we did tutorial five and tutorial six. So that's the documentation for tutorial five and tutorial six. Um, that's done. So we are now on tutorial seven, which means that um, uh, the end is kind of more in sight than it has been, which is always good. So that's coming back. So on the Tuesdays, that's what I'll be working on. And I think the the stuff that I was finding on Tuesday was the fact that I would probably need to do another pass, another review pass of the whole thing again, just because there's a couple of um, issues that I'm finding with the way in which I'm writing the documentation. It's not very consistent. So that's what we'll, I'm probably going to have to do that. It might be a quicker pass than just doing the whole thing from scratch, but there we go. So that's the PHP course login. It's still going on. It's taking a bloody long time, to be honest, but it's uh, it's still going on. And the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the syntax sugar, before we actually get into the topic of today's show, um, is that next Tuesday at 7 p.m., I'm actually going to be doing a talk, giving a talk um, remotely to the Northwest Drupal user group or NWD, sorry, NWDUG, NW Doug. <laughs> um, I will have a link in the show notes below um, for that. Uh, if if anybody's interested, it's a remote talk. So it's a remote talk. The uh, It's on meetup.com. And I will be talking about PHP Stan. This is the talk that I've given in various places this year. And um, I'm giving it to uh, the Northwest Drupal user group next Tuesday at 7 p.m. And it's uh, Code with Confidence Using PHP Stand. That's the title of the talk. Okay, um, apologies. Before we actually get into the syntax sugar stuff, there is a question that I want to answer. The question has come in today, actually. Um, and this is from Daryl Wolf. Wolf, Wolfork, Folk, Wolfork, um, and this is based on the what is a PHP interface. So I, I thought I would just answer this here, and then I'll I'll follow up with actually the text of reply. So this is a comment on the on the what is an interface video that I did tutorial that I did. Okay, so Daryl is asking, uh, what is the point of a contract if your code already agrees on how its classes would work since you have the same name uh, name methods? The process, uh, the process uh, class seems to do uh, what the implementation class uh, would do by passing the class uh, you want want it since you so essentially what we're saying what Daryl's asking is what is the point in having a contract uh, what is the point of having an interface when the interface uh, is defining the methods that the methods are already existing in the concrete class so let's say you've got a class that is a product and that product has um, sort of a, a get product name or get name get price uh, think of other things um, I don't know uh, set content, that kind of stuff. So th those those methods, or you know, calculate, or uh, you know, reorder, or whatever. So th they would have a series of methods. And the question Daryl is posing is, you know, what is the point in having an interface when you could just pass in that class to various different places? Uh, this is a very good question, and, and it, it certainly um, trips me up or ha tripped me up when I started learning what an interface was. It's when you take a step back and you're thinking, well, actually this interface could be used for other classes as well, not just this class that I'm on. So let's say um, I use the product example. Um, let's say we have a, a different type of product. Maybe it's a, um, maybe it's a subscription product, not an actual physical product. Maybe there is a digital product as well. So let's say now you've got three different types of products and those different types of products would have a, uh, a price. So you would have a get price method in all of those three things. 
Now, the method in which you inject that, um, you know, uh, the, the method signature that you would use to, say, inject one of those uh, or all three of those products, you can't easily have like, you know, in the in the in the annotation in the in the um, in the method uh, notation, you can't easily say it has to be this class or it has to be this class or it has to be this class. The best thing to do is to say that it needs to be of this interface because now we're saying that this interface is the contractual agreement between all of these classes. The it the there has been a decision that has been made that all three of these classes, because they implement this particular interface, they therefore must have the signatures that have been laid out in this contract. Um, and that, and that, that really is the, the nuts and bolts of it. You can get into sort of, you know, the, the various different, um, you know, the, you know, the various things of why don't you just have like a product and then you have like a subscription that it extends a product uh, and all sorts. So, but that gets a bit messy. Uh, that gets a bit messy. Excuse me a minute. So, uh, yes, it's, that's the, that's, that's why. I'm sorry, I'm just removing these uh, annoying there we go. So that get, it gets a bit it gets a bit uh, gets a bit complicated when you start using inheritance in that mix um, because then that um, that means that that you're using classes like base classes and then you've got classes that extend those classes and stuff and that can get a bit messy um, if you've got a a, a, su a subscription or a digital product they probably will extend a product. But the and and you could probably get away with putting the get price into the into the product base rather than have an interface. But the thing is, um, you may have to re you may have to do a calculation on that price differently based on whether it's a um, uh, a subscription or whether it's a, a, a digital product or whether it's a, an actual product that you buy off the shelf. And so you'll probably have those methods that probably override various bits and pieces. An interface is an easier way to do it. It's also more um, future-proof as well because you can you can just snap together another product uh, and another type of product um, that implements that particular interface, and you can get nice and abstract with it as well, um, which uh, which is always good. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Daryl. Uh, so what is uh, that is on the what is a PHP interface video? Um, Okay, so let's get into the actual thing of the show, which is what is syntax sugar. So, like I said, this month, this uh, this March, we're going to be dealing with syntax. That is the topic of uh, of uh, the the month. Uh, last month was bugs, and I and the other month was improving as a developer. Um, it's very broad stuff. So. What is syntax sugar? What is that? What does that mean? What does that mean? Um, hmm. <laughs> Where do I start with this? Where do I start with this? So it, it's a term people use, developers use, when we're writing code that is, I guess, more helpful for humans. And dare I say, with a massive asterisk, more readable for humans than say a computer so when we write code we we're obviously writing code that will be ran on a computer but we need to have we need to be able to read it and it needs to be helpful for us as a developer and there are uh, there are the um there are the fundamental ways to do things. They are there are the the more structured ways, I should say, or, to do things. And then there are the syntax sugar ways to do it. The kind of the ways that you could kind of class as like an alias of that thing, the shorthand, if you will, to do that thing. Um, so it's sometimes called candy gramming. So instead of programming, it's candy gramming. Okay. Um, which I don't particularly like. I don't like that term. Um, it can shorten um, so your code into sort of one-liners, right? 
um, which m can, again, massive asterisk, can make it easier for you to read. Um, and it can, massive asterisk, um, make it more helpful for you to maintain in the future. I say massive asterisk because if you were to litter your application with um, syntax sugar all over the place, then it's going to be awfully difficult in the future to unpick all of that. And that's essentially what you will have to do. You will have to unpick the, the, the shorthand notations in order for you to actually get to the raw uh, structured syntax. This means that it can be difficult to change and maintain in the future. So for instance, if your application goes in a totally different direction, or if there's a, um, uh, talking from experience here, if you, if you end up writing a f or improving a feature that alters the, the, the underlying code in a way that means that you have to do a bit of refactoring, which means that you have to do a bit of unpicking of the existing syntax sugar, then that can be quite painful. That can be quite painful. The syntax sugar can make it quicker to write because if you, if your, if your muscle memory, if your mind goes straight to the syntax sugar, because it's short, shorter to write, it's just going to be quicker for you to just knock out and get done rather than the actual structured way of doing and actually, you know, writing particular statements and expressions and all of that jazz. Uh, so if, if your application was just littered with syntax sugar, it's probably, uh, it's probably easier for you to develop on the first pass, but it's going to be awkward in the future to adjust and maintain if you have to unpick some of those things. Um, so you, the, 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 what I'm saying is there's a fine line between it becoming helpful and it becoming painful. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to say. There's a fine line between those two. Um, so it can, it can often lead to magic things happening. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, let's say for example, um, with PHP, of course, you have the uh, magic methods, the bane of my life. These are the getters and the setters. These are the underscore methods. These are the magic methods, the methods that just happen and run in the background. Um, and uh, you need to then discover whether they are actually being used. And there's a lot of code that you have to read. A lot of legacy code uses all of this, um, which isn't fun. <laughs> uh, uh, but it can often lead to quickly creating these shorthand um, uh, routines because you are reliant, you're leaning upon these these magic uh, methods, these hidden hidden magic features of the language, which can be quite troublesome, especially if you're new to the team, new to the application. If your application is is just relying on all of these magic methods all the time. Um, then it can be it can be awkward for you to to uh, to decipher what is currently going on if it's not explicitly said in the method in the structure of the application. So th th that's another point. That's another bad point on uh, syntax sugar is the fact that it will make it awkward for new team members to come on unless they are aware of the. I don't want to use the word workarounds, the, the shorthands that are in place currently. Um, so it may seem like, like I suppose I suppose the takeaway of this this uh, this this discussion is that shorthands, shorthand ways of doing things in your program um, may seem like the obvious and best way of doing it straight away. But in the long term, you may have to unpick that. And that can be quite painful. Uh, that can be quite painful, especially when you've got shorthand on shorthand on shorthand, and it just gets a bit messy. Just gets a bit messy. Um, now, in my opinion, it's not lazy to do this, but there are developers out there who do see um, people using syntax sugar as lazy, lazy programmers, because they're not actually explicitly defining and, 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 and coding the structure of these, of, of whatever it is that you're doing, you're just creating a shorthand and therefore you're taking the short way around rather than the long way, long way around. 
when you define the structure of your of your code, you have to take into consideration various different things um, that uh, that scaffold your condition, your uh, statement, your expression. And that often makes you think about how how you can reuse the reuse it or how you can improve it or um, you know whether or not it's a good thing. In in talking from experience, sometimes I can see that shorthand has been used where shorthand shouldn't be used, and it's just it's just been like a a, a plaster over a big issue, and um, and then when you start getting nested shorthand stuff, and we'll talk about the examples of shorthands in a minute, um, it, it it can become quite painful as I've mentioned. Um. But but personally, I don't see it as a lazy way of programming um, because syntax sugar can be used for good. If someone doesn't know the actual underlying structure, though, of the code, um, so if they can't reverse engineer the shorthand, the the syntax sugar, so they don't actually know what the the shorthand looks like in its in its uh, normalized structured form that to me is a red flag because that to me is that the programmer has has just learned the shorthand that's all they know and they don't know how to deal with um with the 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 underlying root structure of the thing that they're trying to do which is often an issue when you are dealing with legacy code because when there are some syntax sugars that have um, come into play recently on both JavaScript and PHP and other programming languages. So if you come against a legacy application and you don't have the latest version because you just don't have it installed, you are going to be stuck because if all you know is the latest syntax sugar, then it will be it will be very difficult, tricky to to decipher the actual structure of the underlying code. Um, so with that point, I would say don't rely on it. Don't don't re rely on you knowing the syntax sugar. If you it's more important, in my opinion, to know the underlying structure. Um, so. I guess I guess the 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 benefit of syntax sugar is that it reduces the amount of syntax needed to actually do the thing, um, which can make your code cleaner, quote unquote, and more readable, quote unquote. However, again, going back to this fine line, um, if it's done badly, if it's done badly, then it can lead to overcomplication and therefore bad abstraction and then even worse readability for you and your team. So technically speaking, um, it's, well, yeah, I, 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 I'm on the fence of it. I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence. If I was to work on a legacy application, then I would probably prefer less to do uh, syntax sugar and more to do with the actual structure of it. Um, especially if you're trying to navigate you know, can you or can't you upgrade to this particular version of this particular programming language? You know, if there's syntax sugar available in the latest version, that's all well and good. But you have to fully be uh, completely bought into the fact that you're going to do an upgrade. And um, it's it's almost like um, it's almost like a breaking change. You know, if if there's no there's no going back, there's no going back. Essentially, what I'm trying to say. Okay, so. What are examples of syntax sugar? This thing that I've just been babbling on about. What what is it? What what is an example of it? I've, I've talked about the pros and the cons. Let's give you some examples of uh, syntax sugar in JavaScript, for example. So JavaScript is full of syntax sugar, and it's 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 not a a secret that I am not massively keen on JavaScript. Anyway, um, and one of the reasons is because of the amount of syntax sugar in JavaScript. Um, 
because you're you're often stuck with does this framework allow me to do this or is this 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 library allow me to do this i've got no idea um and that can be quite painful and then you know does my various linting things and my other bits and pieces that i'm got in my javascript pipeline are they allowing for these new features coming in Ugh. so anyway anyway okay. examples of syntax sugar in javascript so um the for loop the for loop so you normally you would have like a for and then like an uh, a, a variable and you would say that that variable if it's less than a given number then you would increment uh, that variable each time until it gets to the point where the, the the variable matches the number of the of the of the given length or, or what have you. Well, you can do that um, more in a shorthand way using the for and of um, in JavaScript, which is okay. I'll yeah, that's fine. Uh, something that though isn't great in my opinion is destructing of variables because that the way in which javascript and this is just an in, the inherent thing of javascript the way in which javascript deals with variables and just data types and all of that jazz because it's so fluid and flexible it can if you've got a massive javascript file and you're constantly destructing variables it can get quite annoying <laughs> but this is where you're destructing say an object um, and you're setting variables in this destruction um, thing. And I'm not a massive fan. I'm not really a massive fan of, of that. Um, not really, not really. I suppose the, 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 one of the easiest things to talk about in terms of the uh, syntax sugar is the increment and decrement. So plus, plus, minus, minus. Again, you could, you could just do like, I don't know, whatever the variable is, minus one, or whatever the variable is equals whatever the variable is, minus one, that kind of thing, or plus plus one or whatever. Um, plus plus minus minus, in my opinion, makes sense. It's It makes sense. One thing though, a myth, um, and this is a point that I'll leave on, one point, one myth, I suppose, um, that I, in fact, I thought was a syntax sugar, which isn't syntax sugar, is a ternary statement. A ternary statement is not actually, technically speaking, a uh, piece of syntax sugar. Um, and the reason is because the ternary is actually an expression, whereas the uh, if statement is a statement. The if if condition is a statement. So the uh, the if else statement doesn't actually return anything, but the ternary statement does meaning that it's not uh, you when you're talking about syntax sugar you've got to say that this is syntax sugar of this this is the shorthand of that technically speaking the ternary statement is different from an if statement if else statement um, because as i mentioned the ternary statement will have will return something whereas the if state it, it, the if condition doesn't um <laughs> Uh, so it's yeah it's I, I shouldn't say statement it's the ternary is an expression whereas the if else is a statement that's kind of but the, we're getting into some really weedy semantics there um you know i use the word i use ternary statement ternary expression interchangeably i suppose um you know you know whatever you know sue me so that's syntax sugar i hope i've explain that well uh, um we, we may we, i may probe that a little bit more um in the coming weeks but what i'm going to be doing in in march is talking more about just syntax general syntax and i haven't dialed it down yet as to what topics of syntax i'm going to be talking about because there's going to be like you know three or four episodes in march uh, one of which, though, I really want to talk about, and that is to why one should learn syntax before actually learning um, the the glitzy, glamoury frameworks and libraries. Um, so, learning the, the 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 basics of syntax, and I might come up with a list of all the types of syntax one needs to learn in order to to to, to be in a place where they can actually start 
uh, looking and expanding their horizons into different frameworks and stuff. Because of course, if you were to jump straight onto the framework bag um, uh, wagon, then you're going to be in a world of opinion and um, in, instead of a, instead of a world of fact. Not every framework, not every library is the same. And I'm just going to stop there because we're going to end up talking about that. <laughs> And maybe that's going to be a, a, a topic for another show. Well, before I go, I just want to say um, that this is going to come out on the howtocodewell.fm site tonight. And it's going to hit the podcast players um, like it does every Friday. Um, so you can get that at howtocodewell.fm and you can search for this in pod, in Spotify, in, in, in uh, uh, iTunes and all of those other good places, Google Podcasts, How to Code Well. And uh, thank you very much, Daryl, for uh, the question there on uh, uh, interfaces. I hope I've answered that. If I haven't, please do let me know. I'll follow this up with a message as well, too. And um, I have that link in the show notes if you want to support Ukraine. I just want to say that I hope everybody is safe and um, just take care of everybody and uh, look after each other. And um, I will see you. I will see you on Saturday instead of Sunday because um, I am busy on Sunday. So I'm actually going to be on Twitch on Saturday. I haven't decided the time yet. So it'll probably be mid morning, but I'll let everybody know on Twitter. That's how to, that's uh, tw- uh, twitter.com forward slash how to code well if you're interested on uh, on that. And uh, we'll probably be playing around with a bit more PHP, um, probably a bit of testing, maybe. I've got a whole list of GitHub stuff that I need to deal with, GitHub issues that I need to deal with on how to code well. So we'll probably be tackling that. Anyway, take care, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well, and I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Happy coding. Cheers. Bye-bye.